Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this, the latest in the Royal United Services Institute's adversarial studies seminar series, in which we seek to examine how evolving competitor approaches will force Western and allied nations to adapt in a 21st century competitive environment. I'm Siddharth Korshal. I'm a fellow here at the Institute, and it's my great pleasure today to welcome Dr. Nick Wright, who will be providing us a net assessment of Chinese approaches to innovation and what implications this has for uh, Western and allied nations. Um, it's, uh, it's not uh, any secret and indeed has quite been made quite public in China in you know, policy uh, uh, sort of in, in initiatives like uh, the main tw China 2025 framework that China seeks leadership in a number of key technological domains in which it is deemed strategic. And yet the pace of change has been quite remarkable, whether it's you know, early adoption of 5G or becoming the world's, uh, the world's leading source of um, cited publications on artificial intelligence or the world's second largest biotechnology market, uh, the speed at which China appears to be transforming from a mass manufacturing driven economy to an innovation driven one is, uh, is uh, notable. And of course, this raises uh, significant questions in terms of both its competitive ramifications for the West and what, perhaps, and what perhaps we might learn about both the strengths and fragilities of an innovative ecosystem that is quite different from our own. Here to discuss these themes with us today is Dr. Nick Wright, who's associated with, uh, who's affiliated with both the University College London and Georgetown University. Uh, Nick is a widely published author on subjects ranging from uh, neuroscience uh, to gray zone warfare and artificial intelligence. He works very closely with the Pentagon Joint Staff with whom he's recently co-authored a, uh, a recent report on the subject of uh, uh, adversary approaches to innovation and their implications for the West the findings of which will form uh, much of the basis for today's discussion. Uh, so first of all, Nick, thank you very much for being with us. It's a pleasure to have you on this uh, uh, with us today. Uh, before I turn over to our speaker for the day, uh, just a brief couple of, uh, point, a couple of administrative points from me. Firstly, uh, we will uh, the initial remarks by our speaker will be on the record. However, the question and answer session will be strictly off the record. I would also direct your attention to the Q and A button on the uh, on the bottom co left hand corner of your screens. Uh, please do make liberal use of it, including during the uh, seminar, uh, during the initial remarks rather, and I can uh, collate your questions for the Q&A session once we reach that point. Uh, so with that having been said, uh, Nick, over to you. Great, so uh, Sid, thank you very much for asking to speak. Thank you also to the team at RUSI uh, for putting on this event. Um, so for those of you who have the pleasure of reading documents such as the uh, recently published Interim National Security Strategic Guidance, which is the uh, document produced in or published in March uh, 2021 by the Biden administration, you'll see the importance that's being placed now on innovation. So uh, a quick uh, look at this PDF. Uh, and you can sort of do word searches and you can see in this key document that articulates the, the, um, the New Year's administration's thinking, uh, there are nine mentions of COVID, um, 27 uh, mentions of climate, uh, 34 mentions of alliances, uh, but equal up there with alliances is 34 mentions of technology. Um, and you also have nine mentions of, of, of the word innovation or innovative. So, uh, you know, there is an enormous interest at the moment in technology and technological innovation. So why do people care so much about that uh, now? Um, the, the real reason is that uh, suddenly the US has become aware that there is a peer innovator globally uh, in China uh, and that uh, unless the United States and its allies uh, changes the way that uh, it thinks about innovation, uh, that uh, there are going to be serious ramifications. So why is that? Now I'm going to get to my uh, get to my slides. There we go. Great. So why is that? 
Well, the reason is, is that China is simply uh, doing very uh, interesting and important work. So here we have uh, uh, a new AI model that was announced um, uh, earlier this month. So right at the, you know, within the last uh, three weeks or so called Wudao 2.0. Why does Wudao 2.0 matter? Um, the reason why Wudao 2.0 matters is because it's an AI model that can do a lot of uh, important things. So um, it can uh, do things like uh, understand everyday language, including grammar. It can generate uh, pictures from text. Uh, it can write Chinese classical poems. It basically can do a wide variety of different things. And so here we have uh, this is a, a picture of the announcement of Wudao um, 2.0. And you, what you can see is that um, basically there are there are a set set stuff up against a variety of different um, uh, 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 important uh, uh, benchmarks. And it can do a, a variety of these things. So uh, if you think about the what is held to be the world's best, um, the world's best uh, uh, language generator, which is OpenAI's uh, GPT-3 uh, AI, uh, it can it, it claims anyway that it can do what that AI does, but it's ten times uh, larger. Uh, this AI model, for example, in terms of parameters. So essentially something like you could think about it as 10 times more powerful and it can do a lot of other things as well. And that's really the advance. It's bigger. So um, what, what does this what does this illustrate? This illustrates a number of points. So the first point this illustrates is that um, AI systems, for example, are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So if you if you listen to the announcement from the Beijing um, uh, 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 organization from which this uh, uh, that built this AI, um, it, it essentially is, is using ever bigger data, ever bigger models to do uh, uh, really powerful um, artificial intelligence. And essentially this is mining, um, uh, continuing to mine the big leap that we had in AI uh, related to deep learning that happened around 2012. So it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Another thing we can say is that essentially only the US and China uh, can build uh, AI um, at this scale. This is a race in which the rest of us are, are far behind. That's not to say we can't contribute, but we are currently uh, far behind. So as the chair of the German Federal AI Association, which is an industry body said um, about this announcement, we are about to lose digital sovereignty in the AI space. We don't act right now. Uh, you know, and, and, and as others have said, basically, uh, uh, it's not just Britain, it's not just the EU, it's not just Russia, everybody is now uh, essentially far behind the US and China, um, just in the scale of what they can, of what they can do, of this type of AI system, for example. This also has vast, brings vast commercial opportunities. So why are people like Google interested in this type of technology? The reason is, is that what they want is that um, search in the future might be, you'll search for something and then um, one of these AIs uh, will be able to give you, or basically be able to put together uh, an answer that is expert for you and crafted for you. So it, this could be the next generation of search. Other things like, for example, um, here we have, it could help you, you get, so this, thing, this AI has the ability to create pictures, good pictures from um, text. So you could describe what you, what type of trousers you want, or what type of picture you want, or what type of mug you want, and it can, it, it, it could help you build those things or design those things for you. So you can imagine there are lots of commercial opportunities and that's really important because innovation doesn't just involve inventing clever things, it also invents scaling them and making profits from them. It also matters because this is clearly dual use. So if it can write you know, ancient Chinese poetry, uh, if it can parse different target audiences uh, or, or, or provide audiences for things that they like, for example, then clearly that is dual use, for example, for information operations. You know, there are a, a myriad dual use um, uh, things that one can apply here. And the other thing to say is that, um, is that this was produced um, by uh, the, um, uh, Beijing Academy of, uh, of Artificial Intelligence, um, which has closer government links than for the two uh, essentially Western leading uh, AI labs, uh, DeepMind, which is owned by Google and based in London, and OpenAI uh, on the west coast of the US that are both essentially privately funded. Now that doesn't necessarily uh, matter, um, uh, but it, it's something that people 
that people point to, and I'll, and I'll come back to a discussion of that in a little bit. But this is why people care about China, because China is doing good work. It's doing good, innovative work uh, that basically, essentially, only China and the US can do. So that's an example. And so what does, why does this matter in the broader context? Why are we speaking here at the Royal United Services Institute where you care about security and that kind of stuff? So here we think, so strategy is the art of creating power. So for those of you who've read uh, Lawrence Friedman's a wonderful book on strategy, this is sort of taking uh, his um, definition of strategy. And technological innovation is now central for economic, political and military power. And that's been the case for at least for the last couple of centuries. Now, the question though is not, uh, whether technological innovation is now central for economic, political and military power, that is for strategy, that, uh, that's really, I, I would say, unquestioned. The, 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 the point is, what is the character of innovation now? So, you know, we're not in the Cold War. We're not in the periods before the Cold War. Uh, you know, we're now, we're in 2021. We're going to be moving forwards from this point. So what is the, going to be the character of innovation moving forwards? And I think there are at least two important um, features to the character of innovation now that distinguish it in particular from the character of innovation that occurred during the Cold War. So first of all, it's civilian sectors dominate. Um, and that's the case as much in the US as it is in China. So here we have, uh, so this was actually from a presentation that the um, the director of the Defense Innovation Unit in the US uh, gave to a group I worked with at the Pentagon. And, and, and you know, this is 1960 global R&D expenditures. And you can see that US defense related uh, R&D expenditures were a giant component of that. But you, you have that, you know, 36 percent. Um, so the US uh, and the US military in particular, or defense uh, uh, complex, really dominated global innovation. But what's the case now? Now, in 2016, uh, you can see that it's gone down significantly. And you look at an organization such as DARPA, for example, which has a budget of three and a half uh, billion. Uh, you know, I wouldn't mind having three and a half billion dollars, uh, something along those lines, but that is small compared to the research and development budgets of a company like Google, Apple, etc. So one big thing is, is civilian sex dominate. So if you speak to people who work on this, uh, on the challenge of, of innovation in the US, a big question is how do you try and harness the civilian uh, innovations that are occurring for uh, national security purposes? Another uh, key difference or another key factor or reason why people are caring so much for this now is that um, uh, there is a peer innovator. As I said, there is a peer innovator on the scene now, and that's, you know, people particularly in Washington DC are, are seized of this. Um, now, the US for example, in particular has faced a peer innovator for. So this is Sputnik. So why was DARPA uh, fa uh, founded? It was founded um, uh, uh, explicitly uh, in response to the fact that the US believed it was falling behind technologically in terms of innovation. It faced a peer innovator. The Soviet Union was highly effective at innovation. And, um, and uh, uh, so uh, uh, you know, the US uh, responded effectively. Now, China is now big, um, but uh, the difference is, is that uh, uh, China is in many ways even bigger than the uh, Soviet Union was, or has the potential to be. So the uh, economy of China is, 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 is predicted, obviously all, all things are predictions, and it, it, things, things should not pan out, but it, the Chinese economy is already um, um, uh, the second largest economy in the world by essentially any measure. And it is uh, likely to um, be roughly equal to start surpassing the US, even in nominal terms, uh, by about 2030, 2031, something along those lines. So China is big. And in addition to that, China just has an enormous number of people. So, you know, it, it's great that there are 330 odd million highly innovative uh, people in the United States, but there are about 1,350 uh, million uh, highly, you know, potentially highly innovative people in China. So that is the scale of the challenge from this peer innovator is potentially greater. So what is innovation and, and, and how much of a threat potentially is China all the different aspects of innovation? So partly what I want to do here is, is, is um, get a bit of a better grip of innovation. So innovation is essentially, there is, um, uh, is essentially, there are so many definitions of innovation, but it's essentially about, um, novelty, so uh, bringing novel uh, uh, items, which could be goods or services, 
uh, to, uh, to market and developing them so that they have value for people. That's the, the gist of the thing. And that value could be military value, it could be economic value, whatever it is. That's essentially, those, those are the key things about innovation. Now, how do we uh, get innovation and, and how good is China at these different um, stages? So I'm, I'm gonna um, just talk you through five different things um, to do with innovation. Uh, this draws and slightly adapts a framework in an excellent uh, new book by, um, by uh, uh, Lord Sainsbury, who is the UK Science and Innovation Minister for, for some considerable time, uh, a book called Windows Opportunity. So first of all, let's think about basic scientific research. This is kind of what people often think about when they think about innovation. And um, they think about basic scientific research, boffins in laboratories, tinkering with things. Um, and yes, research universities are very important for basic, basic research. Uh, so basic scientific research, um, uh, so you know, research universities like University College London, where I am, or um, Harvard, MIT, uh, uh, Beijing, you know, Peking University, uh, uh, Tsinghua, which is the top two Chinese universities. So research universities are important. Then you have other types of research institutes like in France, CNRS, well, that's where they do a lot of their research rather than in universities. And Max Planck, a set of institutes used to fund me years ago when I was, when I was uh, uh, a postdoctoral scientist some years ago, uh, uh, Max Planck in Germany. And that's often funded by things like UK, uh, UKRI, UK Research and, uh, um, and Innovation, or the National Science Foundation in, in the US. So you have basic scientific research, and then that goes on to producing generic technologies. So these are uh, technologies that have potential commercial feasibility, um, but they will still need R&D to actually deploy them. And this is the kind of uh, area where DARPA has really um, excelled. You know, it's produced a wide variety of different things. It's funded things like, um, so if you look, for example, at the different components within an iPhone, um, uh, so Mariana Matsukato, who's a scholar at, at UCL, you know, she showed these wonderful, uh, she looked at the different components of iPhone and basically showed that, you know, a lot of them, uh, uh, the, the core components about, you know, how it communicates, how it processes information, uh, Siri, the voice assistant, they actually have their origins within um, uh, 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 government funded uh, uh, generic technologies. So you have this generic technology piece. And then you move on to proprietary research. So now, and the reason why uh, uh, proprietary research doesn't happen so much earlier is, is that, you know, it, if people fund basic, if a company funds basic scientific research or generic technologies, then there is nothing to prevent other companies from uh, basically free riding on that expertise, on that knowledge. So once you then get to proprietary research, then you're thinking about things like intellectual property that can be um, uh, rigorously uh, protected through things like patents and so on. Um, now, there's still R&D that needs to be done for production and processing and so on, but essentially we're at, we're at that stage. Finally, it's about um, scaling up the value. So, uh, you know, can you go uh, uh, from a, you know, plucky startup that does, that's designed Siri uh, and and um, and built it uh, a working model to having Siri deployed uh, around the world in so many uh, different um, uh, things. So and that's where you have companies like Google, Alibaba and so on. And the last thing to talk about is tech infrastructure. So there's a really important thing. So another thing that DARPA and other places do is things like they set up benchmarks. Uh, tests. So how do you know your technology work? How do you know your technology is good? What should people be aiming for? And so your tech infrastructure is really important. International standards organizations, uh, you know, what, when does 5G become good enough to, to roll out? Uh, you know, what type of 5G should we be using? And so on. So that tech infrastructure is also important. So now we've got these five different areas of innovation, and we can look and see how strong China is within these different areas. So let's look first of all at basic scientific research. So the first thing to say is this is back from 2014, uh, and this is the number of publications in the top 1% most cited. This is a highly cited scientific work. So yes, China produces a ton of uh, papers, many of which are of very, very low quality. Um, but actually China, which you can see here, uh, China is the, um, is the, now the number two, so the, so the, by as uh, so this ends in 2014 it goes from 2000 to 2014 what you see is is that china which is a sort of turquoise color china uh, is now the number two uh, country in terms of producing highly cited scientific research 
Um, so it's just overtaken the UK. And really they've come, you know, most of the other countries have stayed pretty much pretty in, in pretty similar positions. You know, USA, Britain, then Germany, and so on. Um, but China is the really big change. China has come from essentially nowhere to uh, being the second largest producer of highly cited scientific research. And I've spent time at, at, at Chinese universities uh, and, and published scientific papers and conducted research with Chinese universities, their top universities, and they are excellent. Uh, they're, they're, they're top institutions. So that's basic scientific research. So what about generic technology? Well, here we have things like Wudao 2.0, and you, you, know, you have um, investments that bring together uh, uh, government organizations, uh, top university researchers and others to, uh, to, to try and bridge that uh, valley of death between having some kind of good scientific idea and actually having a commercially feasible model um, that you can then uh, uh, potentially do things with. But as we saw at the beginning um, of the talk, when I was talking about Wudao 2.0, it can't, you know, it is now going, they're now going to work with Alibaba or with other places in order to try and commercialize this technology. So what about proprietary research? So we can think about patents here. And of course, the famous case is who is leading the 5G patent race, uh, Huawei. Uh, you can have a whole discussion about how you should measure um, uh, the value of the different patents that different countries uh, have. But the gist is, is that as of February 2021, Huawei had done very well um, in terms of patents for 5G technology. And obviously we all know that 5G is going to be important. So what about scaling to value? So I think, um, you know, it, this is from 2018, uh, but, uh, you know, basically the situation, if anything, has got, uh, has got worse. So here what we have is a series of uh, blobs. And these blobs, uh, the bigger the blob, the more the company is worth. So this is market capitalization. In fact, in, the numbers are in euros, billions of euros. And what you see is that there are some gigantic Asian uh, companies by market capitalization. Uh, yes, I fully accept before there are 20 questions saying that's a terrible way of, of, uh, of measuring it. But um, what you can see is, is that there are some very big Chinese companies. Um, and uh, in particular, Tencent and Alibaba. And what about the USA? Obviously, the USA has uh, also a, you know, a, 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 a welter of giant companies. And what about um, Europe? Europe has essentially one uh, giant company, well, this is back in 2018, but the situation has, has barely changed. And obviously the rest of the world uh, also has virtually nothing. So what you've got here is, is that even if you have this innovation ecosystem, the Chinese are highly effective at uh, building global scale companies that can uh, uh, um, uh, build value from innovation at scale. And you see that with, for example, TikTok that has something like 689 million uh, regular users outside China. And in terms of tech infrastructure, what you can see is that uh, this is from the this is on the International Standards Organization. Um, China has increased its uh, presence on international standards bodies uh, between 2011 and 2018. So 2011 is uh, the uh, blue bars, 2018 is the uh, uh, orange bars, and they've increased their uh, presence. Uh, and uh, now these organizations are often still dominated by um, Western. Uh, Western countries or liberal democracies, but China is significantly increasing its, its a power to set standards. But we also need to put some of this in context, and I'm mindful that I want to give a good amount of time for discussion, um, but I think there is some really important um, context uh, to, to, to understand why this very powerful Chinese innovation machine uh, uh, matters, uh, but, but also to, 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 to place it within the bigger picture. So the first thing to say is, is that China is still catching up. China is moving from being a fast follower to frontier innovation, but it's very different being a fast follower. So they're, they're following, they're essentially where, you know, they want to um, uh, build a, uh, a, a high-speed train, you go to Germany, they want to build uh, to, uh, software companies, you have a look at the US. You know, that's very much what they've been doing, they've been copying and they've been doing very well and they've been catching up. But now, for example, in AI, they have reached the uh, frontier. They've reached the frontier. And now, like, like Britain and Germany and America and the rest of us, they've got to invent and innovate in order to make new value. So they're moving from being a catch-up uh, uh, type of economic growth to a frontier innovation type of economic growth. 
The second thing to say is, is that the sectors differ. So China is clearly at the frontier for AI, but at the biological technologies, it's still halfway from being uh, you know, uh, backwards uh, to uh, reaching the, the real cutting edge. Um, the other thing to say is that globalization has been uh, different this time. So one of the critical differences between this epoch of globalization, starting in about 1990, and the globalization that occurred before, is that this time China is building things uh, under the super, or Chinese factories are building things under the super, supervision of often Western companies. And that really matters. So China has basically, so there's a great analogy here in the book by um, Richard Baldwin, which is that um, in the past, globalization was about um, building things and then selling them to other people. Now it's about global value chains, for example, an iPhone that's designed in California and built in China and sold in France. And China is in the middle of that global value chain. And, and what's happened is, is that China now has, uh, 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 China basically has been told how to build iPhones. And, and there's a great analogy that Richard Baldwin describes, which is about the difference between um, uh, in two types of football teams. Old globalization was essentially you have two football teams playing in a league together and they can exchange players. And maybe both teams will benefit because one team needed a better striker and uh, 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 had a good defender and the other one uh, uh, you know, swaps um, a, a defender for a striker and so on. And, and both teams can be better off with that type of globalization. But with this new type of globalization, it's like the, the, the trainer of the, uh, of the better team went, and every Sunday he went and trained the, uh, the, the, the worst team. And so now what you, now that may well be good for the worst team, it may well be good for the trainer, but the degree to which that is any better for the, um, for the, uh, for the better team uh, is, 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 is open to question. So what we've been doing is basically been teaching uh, in the West, we've been hollowing out our own productive capacity in teaching China in particular, um, how to uh, build things. Uh, civil mi military civil fusion. I would just say uh, people make a lot of fuss about this, but um, the history is, is this has been going on for some considerable time. The present is, is that it's quite incomplete. And the future is, is that if they do it, it'll be great. But, you know, the US is also striving to do relatively similar things, actually, in terms of trying to harness uh, and integrate um, some civilian uh, innovation and technolo technological innovation into its um, into its uh, into its uh, 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 defense activities. Um, and uh, espionage. Um, so what I would say is clearly there's a lot of espionage um, that contributes to Chinese innovation. Um, uh, but I think that actually, uh, to some extent, we've just got to suck that up. Uh, to because that's the nature of international competition and to another ex uh, another thing is is that you know obviously uh, uh, you know, we in the west also conduct considerable amounts of espionage and we clearly need to uh, um, continue adapting to the uh, latest uh, technologies to, to protect ourselves uh, and also uh, uh, we should be uh, cautious so one big difference is the degree to which espionage is used for commercial purposes by um by uh, or appears to be used for, for commercial purposes by China, and we need to be careful um, that we try and rein in um, uh, uh, spiraling uh, competition in espionage. We need to basically come to a model of managed openness in our dealings with China. So this is the last um, bit, which is what to do. Um, so the first thing is to set the right goal. Uh, so liberal democracies can face a peer innovator and thrive. Um, and what then we should be doing is trying to seek long-term strategic advantage. Okay, we shouldn't try and dominate because we can't. Um, the, the purpose or our aim here should be strategic advantage. Secondly, we don't just copy Chinese methods. We are already at the productive frontier. Now they're doing catch up growth and therefore they are having very aggressive five year plans, uh, very top down approaches because they can copy, essentially copy a lot of what's, you know, what, what we've already done in the West. Now they're going to have to move to uh, frontier innovation and that's where we are. And what we need to be doing is uh, nourishing uh, uh, our complex ecosystems of the productive frontier. In order to do that, government will be crucial because a lot of the early stages of, of innovation, uh, as I described, the, the you know, DARPA and uh, universities and so on, that is just not going to be funded by the, uh, by the private sector to the degree that we need. And occasionally they come up with useful things like, for example, all of that pointless research they were doing on, on coronavirus vaccines, uh, that was a deeply unsexy uh, and, and poorly funded area of research suddenly seems to be you know, moderately important. 
Allies and partners are also crucial. So we need managed openness because again, 330 odd million uh, people in the US, for example, are just, however innovative they are, they're gonna struggle to compete with 1,350 million uh, odd people in China. And so uh, just to make that, uh, so how does one think about managed openness? So who will invent and build the technology of the future? We need to go beyond sort of ideas of decoupling or dogmatic globalization. I think both those extremes um, are dead as ideas and should be. We need managed openness. So that means in terms of innovation and supply chain, some things will inevitably be domestic. Uh, then the closest allies, so for example, you're thinking about the US or UK, and then close allies, things like Five Eyes, and that is the way things are going with, with AI, for example. Then, of course, other very close allies, you know, and, and, and like-minded nations, the D10 uh, and, and broader networks. And then others, including China. So we need to, uh, 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 we can't steal ourselves off from China, and we don't want to steal ourselves off from China, because they're doing wonderful, wonderful scientific research. And we want to benefit from that. We just want to make sure that we benefit from that without uh, losing uh, um, uh, our own uh, research in ways that we would not we would not want. And so if you'd like to read more, so there's a recent uh, piece in the National Interest about the biological side of this, a recent piece on managed openness published with CSIS, and there are uh, a variety of publications on, uh, on the Intelligent Biology website, including a recent book on AI with scholars from Harvard, MIT, Stanford, and so on, uh, looking at China, AI, Russia, and the global order. Uh, and, uh, and we've also been running a series of events on innovation uh, with officials from the UK, US and others with the Pentagon. And I think that's what uh, uh, Sid was alluding to. And there is a forthcoming report that deals a lot with innovation, uh, but that is still grinding through the process of being read and, 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 and poured over before it's released to the public. So on that note, uh, uh, thank you very much, Sid, and it'll be great to answer some questions. <laughs>